Our Debunking the Seven Myths program is designed for students 11th grade through college. This program addresses the seven leading myths about Genesis, creation, and the flood that are taught in today's colleges, even some Christian colleges. Next, let's investigate whether the ark was seaworthy. God gave certain dimensions to Noah for building the ark. 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Using the nipper cubit at 20.4 inches, this works out to a vessel about 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, and 51 feet high. Accounting for a 15% reduction in volume due to the hull curvature, the ark had about 1.88 million cubic feet of space, the equivalent of 450 semi-trailers of cargo space, twice as long as a Boeing 747 and stretching over one and a half football fields. This was a massive ship. It wasn't a ship at all. It was a box. That's what the Hebrew word literally means, a box. Just like the Ark of the Covenant was just a box too, not a boat. So there's no need to reduce the you know 15% for the curvature of the hull because the Bible doesn't indicate a curvature because boxes don't have hulls. At best, we could call it a crate that could be used for shipping. Maybe it qualifies as a vessel only in the sense that it's a container. We could even call it a shipping container but we cannot call it a ship. We can't really even call it a vessel because that word implies a container for liquids and Noah's Ark doesn't hold water. But was such a vessel seaworthy? Interestingly, the Ark's dimensions were about the same as modern shipping vessels, making a fitting shape for handling ocean swells that are typically spaced out in such a way that ships of this size fare well at sea. So the dimensions given in Genesis, which is the most recent version of the story, matches the dimensions of even the most ancient ships, too. That's not surprising. But the Ark is still not a ship. It's a shipping crate. Answers in Genesis made the Ark in their park look like a boat by giving it features like a bow, stern, and keel, all for a crate that has no means of propulsion or navigation. Adding a keel would have helped it stay upright. Without it, the Ark would have capsized repeatedly. But the Bible doesn't mention a keel. That's just something they added to their so-called Word of God, one of many things they believe the Bible says that it doesn't really say. There were, as yet, no shipwrights who would have understood the point of a keel, so that can't be assumed without mention. And adding a keel would have made construction impossible because it would require this mammoth structure to be propped up on columns. Not that the whole project wasn't already well outside of the skill set of the Stone Age anyway. Besides, if it had a keel, or was supposed to have a keel, then I think God would have used the word for boat, rather than a word that just means box. So we're just talking about a great big, heavily overloaded wooden packing crate, sitting flat on the ground, waiting for a tsunami to smash into it and roll it over and drag it around violently, before tearing the rest of it apart and spilling its contents into high seas. In fact, Dr. Xian Wan Hong, who holds a PhD in applied mechanics from the University of Michigan, conducted a study on the seaworthiness of Noah's Ark at the world-class ship research center CRISO. CRISO stands for the Korea Research Institute of Ships and Ocean Engineering. While this so-called study may have been conducted there in an attempt to make it sound authentic, it wasn't conducted by that organization. Instead, it was funded by the Korean Association of Creation Research, specifically for the purpose of publishing to the Journal of Creation, which is just an online library of apologetics arguments pretending as if creation science is like real science. That's why Dr. Hong's academic credentials are touted so proudly while the overwhelming consensus of professorial PhDs contradicting his research are all ridiculed and dismissed out of hand, as if their combined education, evidence, experience, and expertise don't matter at all uh, against the fallacy of the double standard. Dr. Hong's team compared 12 different hull designs of various proportions and found that the arc, based on the biblical dimensions, outperformed all others because it carefully balanced the conflicting requirements for stability, resistance to capsizing, passenger stability, or sea keeping, and strength. Hmm. That sounds like an impressive study. Except that it could have been done with toy boats in a bathtub and still be just as valid, or invalid in this case. Because all they did was try different versions that were obviously too wide or too tall or too skinny to produce what only seems like serious research. We're talking about apologists whose mission 
is to defend a literal interpretation of Genesis undeterred by any facts and evidence against that interpretation. Because, as Answers in Genesis explained in their own words, they believe that no apparent, perceived, or claimed evidence in any field, including history and chronology, even can be valid if it contradicts the scriptural record. Anyone with a legitimate science degree who goes to work for Answers in Genesis must sign an agreement to adhere to their statement of faith. And they must also attach their own written promise to promote creationism, regardless what the truth turns out to be. How dishonest is that? Because it means that they will ignore and thoughtlessly reject, without consideration, any and all evidence that might ever arise that they might have gotten some or all of it wrong. So that no matter how true the truth really is, no amount of proof will ever change their minds. This is an admission of how unreasonable they are, that they don't care what the truth is, they want to make believe something else instead. The study also confirmed that the ark could handle waves as high as 100 feet without capsizing. How can we be sure about that? Because a wave less than half that size capsized and sunk the Gulf Livestock 1. It was 438 feet long, four-fifths the size of Noah's ark, and it carried less than half as many animals. It had the same basic dimensions as Noah's Ark, except that it was lighter and stronger, and it was built just 20 years ago out of reinforced steel. But it was still tragically lost at sea when the unpredictable happened. This is not the first time a livestock ship has capsized. Over the last decade, at least six livestock carriers have gone down. All these ships had mechanical failures. In 2009, a cargo ship carrying 82 crew members and 43,000 cattle sank close to the Lebanese coast. The ship overturned in stormy weather. It was transporting cattle from Uruguay to Syria. 39 crew members were rescued, others were presumed dead. Most of the cattle drowned in the sea. In 2015, a ship en route from Somalia to the United Arab Emirates went down in the Gulf of Aden. 29 crew members were rescued, but two remained missing. 3,000 animals on board perished at sea. In the same year, 5,000 cows fell into the ocean off the coast of Brazil. This occurred after a Lebanese ship docked at Vila do Conde port capsized. All the crew members were safely rescued. All the cows drowned and many washed up on the shores of the port. In November last year, a livestock carrier with 14,000 sheep sunk near a port in Romania. All 20 Syrian crew members were rescued. Around 30 sheep were found swimming in the ocean. But most of the livestock went down with the ship. Shipping livestock on the high seas is a high-risk trade. All those on board, the crew and the animals are at the mercy of nature, be it heat, storm or high seas. Noah was instructed by God to coat the inside and the outside of the ark with pitch, a thick gooey substance secreted by trees as a means of protection against infection or insect attack. When heated into a liquid state and applied to ship planking, pitch hardens almost instantly into a protective waterproof shell. Very similar to how epoxy or fiberglass are used in shipbuilding today. The strong outer shell provided by hardened pitch adds both strength and waterproofing beyond the natural capability of the wood. And the size of the thing also exceeds the structural capacity for wood as a building material. This is where biblical science starts to fall down. A wooden vessel of this size in a biblical flood would come up against some critical structural issues when at sea. The ark may even break in half. You see, a smaller boat would comfortably float along the waves, over the crests and into the troughs. A vessel the size of Noah's ark would instead suffer substantial strain as it crossed the waves, causing massive amounts of sagging and hogging, which would lead to structural failures in the middle portion of the ark at the top and bottom alternately, as it traveled across the crest and trough of the waves. Structural failures like this even occur in large modern ships. Noah's biggest design problem is that he is limited by the size of available trees. Wood is a great material to build boats from. It's strong and light. However, without modern glues and steel plates, 
and it's not possible for Noah to join all his beams together to create a single super beam strong enough to support the hull. Once he goes longer than an available trunk, he needs to build a giant wooden scaffold inside the boat to keep it from collapsing under the water pressure. Even then, wood isn't the stiffest material, so a well-reinforced biblical super yacht is going to bend like a banana in a big storm. The reasoning behind this is why the largest wooden ship ever constructed, the Wyoming in 1909, was only two-thirds the size of Noah's Ark. And even at this size, the Wyoming flexed and twisted opening up seams in its hull, causing leaks that required pumps to keep the hold only relatively free of water. Despite these measures, it still eventually filled with water and sank in 1924. Remember that the Wyoming also used pitch or tar and or waxed cloth to waterproof the hull, which was also reinforced by steel bands. And yet, even though it was smaller, lighter, better built and not as heavily loaded, it still tore itself apart on much calmer seas than what creationists propose from Noah's Ark. You can't build a wooden ship that big, load it that heavy, and have it survive the worst conditions ever. These divine shipbuilding instructions given to Noah certainly seem to make realistic sense. No, not remotely. This has to be one of the most ridiculous stories that any adult has ever believed. None of it makes any sense, and it begs credulity because it's not at all realistic. All of it contradicts reality, and that includes the design of the Ark. For example, Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis was given a hundred million dollars of other people's money to build this monument to ignorance that's in his Ark Park. He hired a team of more than a thousand skilled craftsmen using power tools and forklifts and hydraulic cranes to assemble so much lumber that it required a fleet of semi-trucks over three million board feet, being the largest timber-framed structure in the whole world, ever. He said they'd have it done in just three years, but it took twice as long as expected, even with all of that experienced labor. And it's not even a real boat. It's just made to look like one and then only from one side. Yet, even though this fantasy facade was never going to move off of its concrete foundation, it still had to be made with steel rivets and braces, such as did not exist until thousands of years after the time alleged for Noah. We are to believe that in 2900 BCE, they had steel rivets and braces. And even though this phony boat was waterproofed by modern means that were not available to Noah, of course, and even though it would never be put in the water, they still had to file an insurance claim for rain damage. How rich is that irony? So they know that what they built wouldn't really hold up. Yet we are to believe that all of this was originally built by one 600-year-old man and his three sons using only hand tools from the Stone Age? How did they bring in the millions of board feet of timber in a single axle wagon pulled by a donkey? How is it possible for anyone to believe all of that at once? Seriously. And if somehow you do believe this story, where humanity survived the worst tempest ever in this enormous yet inexplicably indestructible barge, and Noah's sons now have the knowledge to build such a thing, then why is it that no one ever built anything like it ever again? How come absolutely every other boat that was ever built until thousands of years later was more along the lines of a modest canoe or a floating basket? How come we still can't build a wooden ship like that and have it remain afloat with any kind of load in any kind of storm? Next, let's look at one of the most frequently asked questions about the Ark. How could it fit all the animals? Skeptics frequently scoff at the idea of packing all the animal species onto the Ark, but the solution is found in this very objection. Noah didn't have to load all animal species on the Ark. He only had to load the animal kinds. For example, there are over 300 dog breeds and over 300 horse breeds, and all breeds within these two animal kinds are interfertile, producing offspring representing a mix in between the two parents. The Bible uses the Hebrew word min to imply that whenever two animals are closely related enough that they can still interbreed and bring forth fertile offspring, then they are the same kind. But that's the same definition as the biological species concept. When two sexually reproductive animals can and will interbreed to produce genetically fertile offspring, then they are the same species. Thus, species and kind mean exactly the same thing. 
So what the robot teenager voice is really saying is that they did have to load every animal species on board. Not every breed or subspecies thereof, but at least every one of the millions of species described so far, if not the millions more that are estimated but that still haven't been identified. For example, while there may be hundreds of breeds of domestic dogs, they are all subsets of the species Canis familiaris, which is considered a different species from each of these other canids. Domestic dogs can hybridize with gray wolves, but not with the maned wolf. Nor can they interbreed with the African painted dog, nor the Asian raccoon dog, nor the South American bush dog, because they're all different species who, except for the wolves, cannot bring forth with domestic dogs anymore. So Noah would have to have all of these on his ark, in addition to many more fossil species too, because all modern dogs are canines, just this yellow set. And there are a number of other species in the blue and the red, each representing a series of extinct species within different subfamilies. And Noah would have to have all of them on board too, in addition to another collection of related species of bear dogs and dog bears, which means that you've got to include bears too, as well as procyonids, which means proto-dogs, and seals, since there's a definite genetic link between them and bears. Thus, in that sense, they're all the same kind. But of course, creationists won't accept that. So Noah would have to have all of these and many, many, many more on top of all the horses as well. Of course, there are some 300 breeds of horses within the species Equus ferris. But that doesn't account for other species like donkeys, which typically cannot interbreed with horses or zebras to bring forth after their combined kind. All they can produce is infertile hybrids, usually. So they're still in the same genus, but not the same species anymore. And then again, we have a ton of quasi or quagga types too, like the four-toed Harakatherian that creationists won't admit to, and the three-toed Mesohippus, which they do accept, and even depicted in a cage at their ark park even though they are obviously different species of, you know, from modern horses. So Noah would have to have all of them, plus the three-clawed Calicotheres, which is technically just another three-toed horse. I saw them depicted at the Ark Park too. And then again, this skeleton of Brontotherium shows that it's really just a stout and roided-out horse. And Noah would need all of these and millions more species on top of those. The same is true for many other animal groups, Collapsing these animal trees results in a very feasible number of animal kinds, less than a few thousand, that could board the ark, get off a year later, and then spread around the world and reproduce into the varieties within kinds we see today. Saying that this construct will collapse taxonomic trees reveals that what the nasal teenaged voice said is not true at all, that this is not what creationists mean by kinds. Instead, they ignored the Bible's description and redefined that word to mean a collection of different species within the same genus, or different genera within the same family, or different families within the same taxonomic order. They just move the goalposts wherever they like, based only on their own subjective opinion of appearances, and they will never give any clear definition of what a kind is, or how we could tell one kind from another, because they know there is no such thing as a kind. This is just their way of using evolution to solve the problem of overloading the ark while not admitting that they accept evolution. I mean, they say that they only believe in microevolution, variation within a species, that they don't believe in macroevolution, which is variation from the species level on up, meaning that speciation, which they accept, is part of macroevolution, which they say they reject, and they refuse to recognize the contradiction. They say that millions of years is not enough time for that. Yet, the excuse they use to defend the ark is not just macroevolution, but a super-accelerated, turbocharged, hyper-caffeinated, electro-mega-evolution given gamma radiation, going from just 7,000 original species 4,400 years ago to at least a couple million species only in a single century or so. Except that the Bible says that God himself would send every kind of animal to be saved. And that if any of that whole story is true, which of course we know that none of it is, then over 90% of everything that ever lived went extinct immediately as soon as they got back out of that box, if they didn't die along the way. And that's a pretty pathetic survival rate for anyone claiming to be an omniscient, omnipotent deity. When the Answers in Genesis propaganda mill built their ark in Kentucky, they hired a bunch of artists to sculpt fake animals, including several fossil forms, to show to children. Uh, so like dinosaurs and pterosaurs would be put in cages for the kids to see. Because remember, creationists are not just trying to fit on every species alive today. 
but every species that has ever lived. As if Permian therapsids, Mesozoic dinosaurs, and all the giant perissodactyls of the Cenozoic era all lived at the same time. To say nothing of terrestrial crocodilomorphs of the Triassic, giant carboniferous temnospondyls, triconodont mammals of the Cretaceous, huge terror birds of the Paleocene, and all the myriad other forms that are unique to each geologic period. They're trying to squeeze in a whole lot more animals than they're even aware of, and way more than their bullshit excuse about kinds can account for. And then we have to figure out how they're going to take care of all of these animals. How is a crew of eight supposed to take care of 14,000 individual animals? Did they divide their chores so that each person would have to feed, water, and clean up after 1,750 animals a day? And let's just forget about the fact that everything would need fresh water to drink and that the water would have to be stored on board because there's no way to get it from the outside. Let's just ignore that for the moment and focus on the food alone. The cattle ship Julia A.K. was about half the size of Noah's Ark and she carried only a third as many animals when, after 28 days at sea from Brazil, she was stranded in Cartagena. In just one month, they had already run out of food for the 3,800 cattle on board. Now, cattle eat 24 pounds of food a day. That's two and a half million pounds or 1,277 tons of food for just one month. A large sheep eats 10 pounds of food a day. And if we use a sheep as an example of the average size animal on Noah's Ark, which I've read that is a, you know, a fair estimate, then Noah being at sea for 150 days times 10 pounds of food means 1,500 pounds of food per sheep. If there are 14,000 individual animals, that means an average of 21 million pounds or 10,000 tons of food on top of the millions of pounds of animals that in this already overloaded box. And that's not the only problem. That's not even the biggest problem. When they built the Ark Park, they originally wanted to put in a petting zoo of sorts, but they realized immediately that they couldn't do that because the smells that just a very few animals produce would already be too much for the confined space. Even though they had an enormous system of air conditioning ducts, such as Noah obviously would not have. So the folks at the Ark Encounter know exactly why Noah's Ark can't really be a true story. They know. Ken Ham and his crew know that there is a way to ship this many animals at this scale, even some of the really big animals, with a boat that's just slightly bigger than Noah's Ark. But they also know that that method reveals a fatal flaw in the biblical fable. I'm Daryl Anderson. We're in the port of Fremantle, and this is the MV Bicrooks, the biggest and most technically advanced purpose-built livestock carrying vessel in the world. The MV Bicrooks was one of the first vessels designed specifically to carry export livestock. From the dock or on board, it's a seriously impressive ship. 177 metres long and 31 metres wide, it can carry up to 75,000 sheep or 14,000 cattle, or a mixture of the two. This is one of the fans on board the Bicrooks. It's one of 84 mushrooms, they call them, that form part of the ventilation system that keeps air constantly circulating through the livestock pens down below. The MV Bicrooks is just 22 meters longer and 5 meters wider than Noah's Ark, and it has enough capacity to carry all 7,000 of the species proposed, two of each, so 14,000 individuals. To do that, it comes equipped with 84 powered ventilator fans. And what was the Ark supposed to have? Genesis 6.16 says there's only supposed to be one opening of just 20 inches wide, not even enough for a fully loaded snow shovel. And there would be a lot of shoveling. Even if the eight passengers had a series of ladders and buckets on ropes with pulleys, they'd be frantically shoveling shit out of that one tiny opening until everyone and everything on board died of methane poisoning on the very first day, probably before the, the water was even high enough for the box to float. Now that's a bunch of shit. <laughs> 